Hello, I'm David Hunt. Now, I've got a question for you. Would you take your clothes off in front of a room full of people and then model for them as they paint and draw you? No? Well, neither would I. But my next guest, he does that for a living, along, along with other stuff. <laughs> I'm talking about John McCullough, which is really interesting as Irish, and we'll get back, we'll get to that a little bit later. Hello, John. Hi, David. Uh, now you're an actor. I am. I uh, am. You're a voiceover uh, person as well. Absolutely. And you're an artist model. Yes. Yes. Wow! Can't yes. wait to talk to you about that. Sure. Sure. Uh, and you're a father as well. I am. I've got three young adult uh, children. Right. Wonderful people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's go way back. Mm. Um, you know, like as, as I mentioned, um, Matt Culler, uh, yeah. but it's the silent GH on the end. That's right, that's uh, right. Which means it's we're from where? Well, it's from Northern Ireland, right. near Belfast, apparently. Okay. And uh, the Irish pronounce my name McCulloch, but we don't, in our Australian accent, have yeah. the oh sound, so it's yeah. become McCulloch. Yeah. <laughs> We, yeah. Which is really weird because when you look at it, it doesn't look like colour at all, the, no. the, the way the word's spelled. When did um, parents or gra was it grandparents that came yeah. to Australia? Well, or? it's not that far back, really. Um, my great-grandparents came out in the 1860s during the gold rush. Ah. Um, there were two McCullers that came out, a John McCullough and a James McCullough. I've descended from James McCullough. Were they related? Two or? brothers. Yeah. Oh, they were two brothers, yeah. right. Yeah. And they came out to the Victorian gold fields around Beechworth. Yep. Uh, and apparently they also then went over to the Californian gold fields. And there are a lot of McCulloughs over in California, oh, in okay. America. Yeah. Must be related, obviously, yeah. from Northern Ireland originally. And, uh, but they came back to the Victorian gold fields and settled there. Oh, so they came to Australia, mm. went to California, and then came back. Yes. Wow, yes. that would have been pretty ambitious back in you yeah, know, like that era. Absolutely. Wow. I think they must have been starved out of Ireland as well. You know, yeah. And, and which, these, these young men had nothing to lose, only no. something to gain, a new life, an adventure, yep. new beginning, because I think it was pretty, uh, pretty bleak oh, where they lived at that time. It certainly would have been. Mm. Okay, moving forward, your father... Uh, yeah. Was he in that you know, like regional Victoria? Yeah, or? he came. He was born in Yakandanda, right. an old gold rush, gold mining town, and he uh, grew up in Beechworth. And my grandfather was a warden in the Beechworth jail where Ned Kelly spent some time. Oh my God. Uh, although their paths didn't cross, but yeah. a similar sort of period in uh -huh. history. And uh, yeah, my dad um, became a bank manager and. Uh, although his career was interrupted with the Second World War and he joined the army and uh, served in New Guinea. Had he met your mother before then? No, oh. no, he met my mother at a RSL return soldiers okay. dance and right. uh, he brought a girlfriend along but he ended up taking my mother home and oh. proposed within three weeks apparently. Really? Yeah, wow. So he fell madly in love <laughs> with this city girl in St Kilda. <laughs> right, okay. She was a city girl, mm. um, obviously in a regional area at that time. Yes. Uh, so did they move into the city then? No, my mother was living in the, in the city, in, yep. in St Kilda, St yep. Kilda East, and, uh, and my dad had moved from the country, regional yep. Victoria, after the war. Yep. But just getting back to Dad, when he came back from the war, it was a pretty horrific time because he came back from New Guinea with malnutrition, oh, tropical gosh. ulcers, not to mention post-traumatic stress, yep. you know. And it wasn't dealt with that stress. Oh, it wasn't dealt with at all. You know, come no. on, you be a man yeah. and you know, just get through it. I've heard some terrible stories mm. how uh, a lot of men you know, become uh, alcoholics or um, you know, like go mad, you know, ended yeah. up in a silence. Well, I'll just tell you a quick story. Um, when Dad was convalescing at the Stonington Hospital, which coincidentally I ended up going to for a while to study teaching once, Dad was told by his doctor, Gavin, there's a, there's a pub on the corner. Go up there, have a few beers, you'll be right. And so he did, and he didn't stop drinking. And he took up smoking and yeah. 60 cigarettes a day. Yeah just to numb the pain because yeah. there was no counselling. Have a few no. beers, mate, you'll be right. Yeah. That, was the, that was the attitude, that was the approach with people back from the Second World yeah. War. How was he as a dad? You know, like did, mm -hmm. you know, cause quite often um, the, the alcohol and the, the trauma, yeah. um, you know, like he suffers from it and it yeah. takes it yeah. out on the kids. Yeah, or? he was a very uh, strict sort of dad. Yeah. Um, bringing up children was strictly women's work. So his interaction was, with me as a child was was pretty minimal, okay. but he had a good sense of humour and was, right. uh, but became very antisocial in later life. 
became quite reclusive and probably depressive, but it went undiagnosed in yeah. those days. Whereas these days, if we're a bit depressed, we'll admit to it. Because depression for men of that generation was a sign of weakness. You mm. never admitted it. Yeah, yeah. You as a kid, mm. you know, a happy childhood? Absolutely. I had a beautiful childhood. Um, I was born in 1961. I've just turned 60 in January. Right. This Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and I, I didn't have a remarkable childhood, but I had a beautiful happy childhood. I feel very fortunate. Um, and I was a sort of a, a gentle sort of creative kid and, and I don't think my dad quite understood me. I had two older sisters and I was this uh, yeah, creative, artistic sort of uh, child, a little bit withdrawn, lost in my own thoughts, a bit of a dreamer, yeah. wanted to be an actor or a pop star eventually. He, he didn't quite get me. He just thought I should get a conventional job mm. in the bank like he did, but yeah. I, I would have killed myself. I think I would have yeah. died from boredom. So and so we were living on different planets. We were yeah. very different. Yeah. Mm. But it also would have been hard, John, uh, in that era to, uh, you know, like if you were interested in acting, to follow that path yes, in a way. Yes, yes. So what, what did you do? What did you do well, I wanted did you? to be an actor, but yeah. uh, I instead did something a bit more conventional and trained to be a primary school teacher, oh, okay. but specialised in drama and right. physical education. Um, and that's what I did, but then I, I pursued my drama in my spare time as a young teacher and did workshops in my own time and amateur theatre, and it got to the point where it became my absolute passion and I wanted to be an actor, so I simply resigned, moved away from my teaching, uh, and then uh, pursued my acting and my voiceovers, mainly film work and voiceovers. Right. And this, we're talking early 90s at this stage. Okay. That, mm. That's a gutsy thing to do, you know, because mm. a teacher, you know, that's a regular income, yeah. safe income. Yeah. Uh, so, but following that passion as an mm. actor. It was, was a risk. Um, my wife at the time, I was married at the time, and she was very encouraging of my um, creative pursuits. She knew that it was very important to me, so she supported me every step of the way, fortunately. Right. Um, I had her absolute backing and encouragement. And we've always worked as a team like that when we were married and right. encouraged each other in our various pursuits. I'm going to jump a hell of a lot f uh, yeah. you know, further mm. here. You're actually now separated or yes, divorced? Yes, yeah. just, and, just recently. Yeah. And you are actually come out as being gay? I have come out as gay, yeah. After all this time? Yes. With three yes. children who yes. are growing up? Yes. Um, <laughs> Okay, let, let's go. Let, well, why, how, when? You know, I know, like, yeah. Uh, oh. did, did you have any inkling when you were a late teens, early 20s? I think or? so, but it didn't quite fit in with my scheme of things and how I wanted to live my life. It frightened me. Right. The same-sex feelings, attraction feelings, frightened me. It, was it um, have, having that relationship or what the you know, like everyone would have thought? Um yeah, the idea of living my life as a gay man at that time didn't fit into the scheme of things for me and uh, wasn't my idea of how I wanted to live my life. So I must have been, when I think back, I must have been bisexual, but I simply suppressed those same-sex attraction urges okay. and went with my heterosexual urges, which were definitely there, and yeah. I fell madly in love with women, had very healthy sex lives with women, and I just adore women, mm. and I certainly married one, mm. and I still love her. Right. I love her to bits. How did she react when you actually turned around and said, mm, I've got something to tell you? Yeah, I, I think it didn't come as a complete surprise because she had asked me once or twice over the last few years, John, are you, are you gay? Because she just had an inkling, you know. She was the closest person to me in my whole life, and. We, we just loved each other and she knew me completely. So I just, she had an inkling and she probably can't put her finger on it as to why, but she suspected. So when I came out and I wrote her a, a, a detailed letter and we sat together while she read that letter and then I was there to answer any questions, we gave each other a huge hug and said we loved each other. But still, even though she suspected, she, she after a day or two, felt like she'd been run over by a truck. Mm. She's completely shattered, devastated, mm. heartbroken. Mm. I was the love of her life. She's the love of my life yep. um, and always will be. So it's not my love that's in question for her. Yep. It's my sexuality. And I've had to come clean because it got to a point where it was screaming at me because over a lifetime I've understood 
speaking to my psychologist and other people, sexuality can be a fluid thing and there was a shift in the continuum and I was finding I was looking at men more than women. You know, there was something going on in my brain and I can't explain it. It's obviously always been within me. It's yep. how I was born. Yep. But I, I, I'm more attracted to men. Yep. And, and that's the reality. And I've had to deal with that. Otherwise, mental health. Yeah, mm. exactly. And were you, and again, if you mm. don't want to answer this, that's, oh, that's fine. fine. Um, were you having sex with men or seeing men when you were still married and living with your wife? No, apart from one encounter, um, and that's when I was uh, modelling for an artist, one on one, and uh, and my body reacted in a certain way as a nude model to this artist, um, and we acted on that. Nothing too major went on between mm -hmm. us, but. It confirmed for me in my mind that I am a gay man. So I perhaps needed that that experience to confirm once and for all what I really am mm. at this point in my life. Mm. I haven't always been like this, but yep. as I said, there's been some shift. It can be a fluid yeah. thing. And mm. how how does it feel now? And especially having this conversation mm. with with me now. I know you, but I don't know you all that well. Sure. So you you know, and you're actually talking to a wider audience as well. Yeah. Have you realised that, that these are cameras that you... I've got in? nothing to hide, you know. Yeah. I just think I've spent so long not feeling a real sense of belonging or fitting in anywhere, and now I do. I feel a, a, a strong sense of belonging and where I fit in the world, and, and I'm very comfortable about it and Good. talking about it. Good. And I think if I can talk about it, it might help some other closeted people out there because... Yep. I think there's a bit of it about. A lot of younger people these days, it's very mm. easy mm. to, to sure. come out. Sure. And they're doing it, and, and which is the most beautiful thing. Mm. But mm. they're, you know, as older generations that, you know, like, and I know so many uh, men uh, like yourself yes. who were married with children and then yes. just thought, oh, I've, yes. I've just got to follow um, yeah. the road that I That's obviously right. needed to follow yeah. way back. Yeah. yeah. Because sadly, I was, a few years ago, I was having. Um, dark thoughts, suicidal thoughts. I honestly felt when I was in that dark place that that would be the best way out. Oh. That my family wouldn't have to endure what they're enduring now. Yeah. Uh, I'm certainly pleased I didn't go yeah. down that track. Yeah. Um, I, I, I sought treatment and I've still been seeing a psychologist who, by the way, has been an amazing support. He himself is a gay man and went yep. through a similar uh, journey. Right. I'm going and through now. How, how did you find that um, mm. uh, that person, John? Uh, did yeah. you go through one of the organisations or yeah, did you assess it yourself? I rang up Q Life, yeah. which is a helpline for men like me or yep. women, and uh, they they referred me to this brilliant psychologist. Fantastic. I cannot recommend him anymore. He's right. just been a lifesaver. We'll move away from that, and what and thank you for sharing My that pleasure. with us. Um, at, uh, a, a great story. Mm. Being mm. an actor, uh, yeah. you know, like it's your pretty much your sole income, uh, as yeah. well as the modelling, mm -hmm. which uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Yes. Uh, let's talk about acting. Mm. Well, well, mm. What have you done? What, what are you doing? All right. Um, I've just finished, uh, well, before lockdown, thank goodness, we finished shooting. I finished a feature film, a dark comedy. It was a lead role, a serial killer on the run. <laughs> <laughs> Love those things. <laughs> Love them. Uh, filmed around Wood End, and we spent a lot of time filming it um, and it was, yeah, labour of love. Hopefully it will get a distributor and um, hit mainstream cinemas, Netflix, etc. Uh, and I've been cast in this same um, filmmaker's film this year, uh, another dark comedy. Right, okay. Mm. Um, so it's not a guarantee that this is going to see the light of day. No. Wow, I, that, no. how frustrating mm. is that being yeah, an actor? Yeah. Well, very frustrating. You put well, you know, a lot of commitment into the, the whole process, of course, um, and you may not get the financial reward at the end of it. Have you seen the film? I have seen it. Uh, it's still in post-production yeah. and the sound yeah. is still being worked on, but, but all the visuals you, have been and, and were you happy with it? Do you think it's got a chance? Yeah, I think so. For me personally, uh, a sign of, of, of a good film is when you, you don't want to just hide under the seat. If it makes you squirm at any point, it's not a good film, no. especially if it's your own performance up mm. there on the screen and I'm squirming, not a good sign. <laughs> I, I, I didn't squirm, so I, I've got a good feeling about this one. Yeah, 
so mm. I, I'm, I'm just going to take it a little bit further there, and, and this comes into the modeling as well, sure. where you said about the squirming, about <laughs> look, seeing yourself. How how do you take yourself as an actor when you see yourself on a screen? You know, like or or you see somebody that's drawn you. Um, yeah, you know, like do you get a little bit sort of shy on it and a little bit embarrassed, or have you worked out the way of of getting? on top of that? Uh, I think I have. Well, I have. I've worked out how to get on top of that uh, just through experience, self-confidence, I think. Uh, it's all about confidence when you're a performer and when you're a life model. You have to feel comfortable in your own skin, basically. Yep. And I think that can come with age. Mm. If I was doing life modelling, performing as a much younger man, maybe I'd, I'd struggle, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm more self-assured now and mm. more comfortable about my performances and and I certainly don't mind taking my clothes off in front of a group of artists. It's mm. just no big deal to me because it's art and it's and it's a wonderful thing to do to inspire artists and photographers. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. When did it first happen, John? You know, like, oh, did yeah. you take your clothes off for a film to begin with? Yes. Or was that your first mm. time? I did. I, I uh, did a nude scene in a short film for VCA, a VCA student, graduate student, and it was a very tasteful artistic scene and I had no qualms about it. It was a closed set. I couldn't have cared if the whole crew were there because really it was nothing to worry about. It was yep. just a beautiful scene shot. Um, it was my back um, looking out a window and, and I thought this was a piece of cake. I thought, well, I, I, could, I could do this mm. as an income on the side. Uh, and I did a a workshop with the Life Model Society and, and was um, accepted and included on their list and I went from there and I marketed myself pretty heavily uh, and being an actor I sort of know how to market myself in a, in a way where you're not a real nuisance um, and, and ended up working regularly and right. I'm probably, and it sounds like I'm being a real big noter here, but I'm probably one of the busiest male life models in Melbourne I would say. Oh wow, mm. fantastic. And and you know, and that that's the a, a sign of a a smart artist per mm. se is that you because you have to push yourself forward, you don't do. you? You, you know, do. no matter what form of art you're doing, yeah. or the artist that's that's um, drawing yeah. or painting. Yes, yeah. you know, you have to mm. you know, like sell yourself as yeah. well. Oh no, I can't. I'm the professional artist. Yeah. You know, like you, you've got to mm. sell yourself, don't and, you? And if you don't sell yourself, no one else will. The yeah. old the old catch cry. But yeah. It's all about making connections and networking and the longer you do something, the more those connections grow. And and I'd like to think I'm not a pain in the ass to work with either, that I'm pretty, you know, cooperative and mm. and uh, and I like to collaborate with the artists mm. and work closely with them and chat to them in my breaks. And yep. I'm gowned up at this stage, by the way. <laughs> in the breaks, I'll put my robe on. <laughs> We're not meant to walk around <laughs> nude. Bit off putting, or, or or just a mask on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I I I couldn't do it. Mm. I don't I don't think I could do it. Mm. Uh, but it's, as you said, it's a mind the mindset. You know, like what what do you do when you know, like all of a sudden you're you've got ten ten people, yeah, a dozen, you, uh, yeah, mm. uh, and you're there. You know, like do they direct you or do you help them because you're a professional at this mm. and saying. Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Sure, you you come up with the poses generally. Some some conveners will micromanage your poses a little bit, but that's pretty rare. Uh, normally, I'll come up with the poses and and a session, a typical two hour life drawing session. Two we'll, hours? Yeah, normally. Whoa. We'll start off with short poses leading up to the long ones, and and it's up to the model to ensure that your poses are challenging for the artist, inspiring, um, different heights, you create different shapes with your body, uh, you make sure that not the same people have a view of your back the whole time. You've just got to be conscious of the spaces around you and, and, and the artists and um, yeah, and excite them with, with your body. Make, it's not, I'm not talking in a sexual sense. Yeah, of course. <laughs> because it's not a sexual experience. We're yep. talking art and, yep. and, and uh, keeping it all very tasteful yep. and it is. I, I see um, some shows on TV mm. where um, a, an artist is um, drawing, and um, the the subject is just sitting there. You know, like mm. you're you're doing it very differently. You know, like um, so. How how does the artist capture that moment that they want? Do they often ask you to repeat something you've done? Uh, rarely. Um, now, a long pose, a long sitting, for instance, 
yesterday and the day before I did uh, two days of a portrait workshop and it was just purely sitting in a chair, just a head and shoulders study. So that's just looking at a spot on the wall and not particularly exciting I must say. Mm. And uh, you, you go into a bit of a hypnotic trance and I, I personally prefer the short poses leading up to long poses, yep. uh, the, the poses that are more dynamic, it's more enjoyable for me and challenging and physical, it's like a physical workout. So uh, I think if I'm enjoying myself posing, the artists are going to enjoy drawing me. Yep, mm. yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, mm. to totally. And um, and your, the feedback, are you getting it instantly? Uh, you're like, can you actually pick up from the people um, you're like drawing you or painting you that they're you might hear the odd gasp thinking, oh, that's a perfect, um, or they're so yeah, concentrating on yeah. what they're doing. They're in the zone, they're concentrating. Okay. It's during the breaks they'll, they'll say to you, hopefully, oh, enjoying your poses, John, uh, well done, you know, mm. have to get you back next time, or, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the key uh, mm. for to, to be invited back. Yes. Uh, because, you know, like, that's it's your mm. livelihood, mm. That's right. and you you need to please mm. to to get exactly. the next gig. That's exactly yeah. right. Now you were mm. saying it was two two days in a row. You're like, mm. so are you working? You know, like most weeks as a uh, model during COVID. No, apart from the odd uh, during lockdown. No, apart from the odd um, Zoom session. Uh, but that you can't beat the live experience. Mm. Of course. Of course. Um, yeah, I'm starting to get my work back now, which is really exciting. And, and uh, the unis haven't started back yet, but I'll work a lot for all the major universities in Melbourne as okay. well. So okay. RMIT and VCA and Monash Uni uh, and Melbourne Polytechnic. So the universities keep me really busy yeah, as well during I, the I, academic I year. could imagine. Mm. So do you use an agent for that or do you do that for you, yourself? No, no. You just build up the connections and, as I said, you you uh, come across as a you know professional sort of model, arrive on time and come up with the goods and, and collaborate with artists and hopefully be pleasant, you know, uh, <laughs> and and just and just remind people that you're still around because a lot of it's pretty transient. A lot of models um, will just do the work for a short time and then move on. But for me personally, it suits my way of life. This is my ninth year, or is it my tenth? Okay. So, as a life model, yeah. um, and it supplements my income. Uh, and as an actor in Australia, you have to do other things. Yeah, of um, course. And my voiceovers also supplement my income, so narrations and commercials. For, yeah. So mm. you're you're making a full time living out of yeah, you know, like the, the mm. voiceover, the modelling, mm. and your acting. Yes, yeah, not full time. I'm not on a big income particularly, but I'm. Uh, healthy and I'm happy and I'm motivated and I'm passionate, I'm 60 and I can't see myself not working ever because it's, what do they say, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your yeah. life and that's yeah. how I feel yeah. about what I do. Yeah. I really genuinely love what I do yeah. uh, and the creative people I connect with and the friendships I make through the community, the whole art acting community, I've made some beautiful friendships. Um, so uh, I'm sort of embedded in the arts mm. and and I, I really love it I, mm. I can't see myself slowing down so mm. so John this moment in time you must be pretty much the happiest you've you've ever been uh, because mm. of the the coming out mm. um, experience yeah. as well as all the work although it would yeah. have been a tough year last mm. year for it you because um, uh, you know like you wouldn't have had hardly anything no, coming no. through uh, now interesting last year the advantage of lockdown for me personally was that I didn't have the distraction of work so I could concentrate on my coming out and my mental health ah. and go about it in a really considered humane way if you like. It's still always going to impact heavily on loved ones but yep. um, I'd like to think I did it. There's no perfect way of coming out you know there's going to be a and ripple and every effect, huge ripple effect. Different. Every, every story, story is different. different and they're usually associated with a bit of pain and yeah, I've gone through a lot of pain, probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my whole life. Mm. Happy now, I'm definitely happy. I'm, I'm a more authentic version of myself. I'm, I'm motivated. Almost overnight, I was doing more things around the house. It was really interesting. I, I was less preoccupied with inner conflict, guilt, self-loathing. And all of a sudden, literally overnight, I felt a weight lifted from me. Yeah. And, and, and I was motivated to cook, garden, shop, you know, just be a better person around the house. <laughs> it was, I was probably the husband I 
should have been for years. Uh, so it was quite ironic and a bit sad too that I can't be that husband uh, now because, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've, we've, we're living separately. It's hard in that I miss my former life that I really valued and cherished and spent many years building up. Yep. My house, my pets, my, my kids, my beautiful wife. So it's been huge and, and, and that's been the issue, you know. Mm. I, I was, a, a lot was at stake coming out, but I had no choice, yep. I had to. Yep. You don't necessarily choose these things. Mm. You don't choose to be gay, yep. it's how you are. Your three kids, mm. uh, coming out to them, you yeah. know, like, uh, obviously, you told your wife first, yeah. mm -hmm. and did she want to be there when you told them, or did you do that I, separately? Or did I you did do it separately it? with my children. My son came home that night, my youngest, he's, he was 19 or 20, and uh, again, I wrote a letter for him, as I did for my two daughters, and I was sitting with them and uh, there to answer any questions in the same way. I came out to my wife, and I, I cannot be happier with the way my children reacted. The, the support and love from them is just phenomenal. Um, I have a gay daughter, my middle child, a singer-songwriter okay. who's releasing an album next year. Just thought I'd plug that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they have just, they check in on me. Dad, oh, how are you going? Yeah. I catch up with my son for, for beers and I see my daughter separately and together sometimes too. Um, and yeah, I, I cannot, because I'm sort of part of a support network, other gay dads, and some of the stories I hear yep. of, of wives just demonising them mm. to their friends and family yep. and young yep. children, and the children turn against the fathers. Yep. I've had a dream run. I'm not saying it's all been easy, because my beautiful wife is still heartbroken and disoriented, yep. uh, but she's getting there. Yep. She's coming to a point of acceptance, because I've had longer to process all this. She hasn't. Mm. Um, I just love and respect her so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and But the stories I'm hearing from other gay dads can be really difficult. Yep. Oh, yeah. Really I, some difficult. of the stories I've heard over the years. Yeah. I don't want to put anyone off coming out because if you are a gay man in a marriage, um, I think it's important to face up to what you are for your yep. own mental health and for your loved one's sake yep. in the long term as well. Yep. That's, that's how I think anyway. Yep. Now, you were saying uh, that you can continue on doing what you're doing, mm. and especially an actor, because there has to be older yes, actors that's right. uh, in, um, in uh, shows. And, mm. and, and I think they're writing more parts for older actors because yes, of yeah. the, you know, like the baby boomers. Um, yes. and, and they're out there spending the money go, going to the theatre or to, um, mm. to see a movie mm. or, or whatever. Yes. Uh, and modelling again, um, you can continue on being, being a model. Yes. Uh, but is there, and, you're like, and now with the uh, mm. newfound um, being you know, really who you are, mm. Mm. is there one thing now, John, that mm. you want to look at and move forward at, the, you know, at that light at the end of the tunnel? Is there something that you would like to achieve? Um, Which you're pretty much done. I probably have. I, I, I'm, I'm greedy. I'd love to do another lead role, which looks like I have next year, or this year, <laughs> 2021. Uh, in fact, there might be two feature film lead roles. Wow, that's now, pretty big. Yeah, well, they're independent films. Mm. They don't always hit mainstream cinemas. But Netflix, you mentioned there, mm, you know, mm. the streaming services now can make um, That's right. a huge difference, can't yes, they? Yes, So I've always wanted a lead role in a feature film and I seem to be achieving that now as an older person, as an actor. So that is exciting. So I want to stay on that path. And basically I want to just continue the way I'm, I'm continuing because I'm, I'm very fulfilled uh, and my, my life modelling, yeah, continue. I, I probably value that just as much as my acting now, which I never thought okay. would be the case. But, but it's also a, a case, John, that the fact that you've built that that um, reputation up mm. and, and you've done it yourself, you know, mm. like uh, there's no agent or whatever, it's yes. just you. Sure. And, uh, and, and it must, must be because, and you, you get a feedback straight away, don't mm. you, where acting, um, it's True. a film and you, yeah. it's years down the track mm. or it might mm. not even see the That's light right. of day. Exactly. But you, at the end of a session, you're, mm. you're getting mm. your feedback, aren't you? Exactly. Yeah, no, you, you make good points there. I, I just uh, went to a premiere film screening a few nights ago. It was a short film I did three years ago, oh, wow. <laughs> so, so finally I got to see it yeah. and get the feedback. <laughs> oh, that was great. <laughs> but 
as you say, with the with the modelling, you you are getting the feedback on the spot. You know, um, when you're wandering around during the breaks and and interacting with the with the artists. So yeah, yeah, it's more immediate. John, and I'm going to actually use this because it's what you use on Instagram. Mm. John McModel. Model. That's uh, right. But better known as John McCullough. Correct. Uh, because of the, the the strange way that you know, the yeah. Irish and the spelling. <laughs> yes. uh, what a pleasure and thank you for opening up and telling us um, so much about you and and as you said you know like if you can help other people mm. come out mm. uh, with this story because sure. a, 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 yeah a really tough thing mm. and, and mm. the love of your wife and uh, your children yes. uh, really oh. shone through in this interview today thank you yeah I can't oh, I'm all tear up but I, I really can't thank my family enough Yep. the love and support that yep. I receive from them. Yep. Unbelievable. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a big hug once, <laughs> once we finish here. Thank yeah. you so much. My pleasure, David. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Great to talk. I'm David Hunt, and we'll be back with another incredible story. How can we top this one? See you soon.